Peter Kraus, Rural Development Finance and Policy Committee to order. Let the re record reflect today is March 16th, 2022. It is now 3.05 and we do have a quorum present. Members, today we have two bills. We have Senate File 3964 and Senate File 2537. The first bill, Senate File 3964, Senator Frentz. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you members for hearing Senate File 3964. One of the things this committee's done a good job with is to help meet processors be educated, and this bill would help provide for a position at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture to help the certification process, a navigator, if you will. I wanna start by thanking my co-authors. That includes Senator Goggin, Senator Dames, Senator Murphy, and Senator Eakin. And what we're trying to do here is appropriate $150,000. We have witnesses who will talk about it, but here's the high level view members. We have about 241 custom exempt meat processors now. We have another 53 equal to poultry processors, and we want to provide help for them getting the certification done. And here's an area which would expand what MDA is doing now. And that's what I would call the outreach part. The person would be able to go to the processors, help them be prepared for compliance and certification issues. So as opposed to some of the staffing that we have now, which does an excellent job, we would provide an additional outreach component. And hopefully this will be supportive of the meat and poultry processors that we have. And we'd like to be looking ahead to help grow that part of the economy by providing a pathway for certification to the new business owners who think that they'd like to get into meat or poultry processing. And with that, Mr. Chair, as you can see on the agenda, we have three witnesses and I'd be happy to answer questions. There's no amendments um, or however the chair wants to proceed. Well, thank you, Senator Prince. And I think we'll start with your testifiers. And then if there's questions, we'll take the questions at the end. Uh, Jim Gardner. Hi, can everybody hear me? Are you with us, Jim? Uh, can everybody hear me? There he is. There you are. Hi, can you all hear me? We sure can, and Jim, uh, welcome to the Ag and Rural Development Finance and Policy Committee. If you'd please introduce yourself and state who you're with and proceed with your testimony, we would appreciate it. Okay. Mr. Chair, <coughs> committee, thank you for having me today. My name is Jim Gardner, and I am a member of the Land Stewardship Project. Two years ago, my wife Ellen and I started Gardner Family Farm near Spring Grove, Minnesota to raise livestock regeneratively provide families with the best meat possible and to provide our family with a quality of life only a small family farm can provide. Ellen and I raise and process chickens and turkeys on our farm to sell directly to consumers. Last year, we processed 1,200 chickens and turkeys. And this year, we will process 1,750 chickens and turkeys. Building an on-farm poultry processing facility from scratch that meets the establishment grounds and facility standards required by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture has cost Ellen and I uh, just over $25,000 so far. The rules and regulations pertaining to on-farm meat processing in Minnesota are confusing and in some cases um, are subjective and depend on the person you, you uh, talk to. Um, the highest priority for Ellen and I with poultry processing is to provide families we feed with the safest product possible. We are trying our best to follow every rule and regulation but due to the, to the complexities of poultry processing laws, we sometimes find ourselves second guessing if we are or are not within the law. I strongly support SF3964 because it will help small meat processors um, in Minnesota like myself to provide the safest product possible for families. More importantly, it'll help small meat processors um, to get started and get, get off the ground, which will help tremendously with the bottleneck going on in local meat processing today. Um, on, for my farm, our goal is to become a uh, Minnesota equal to poultry processing facility. Um, we want to open our doors to other poultry farmers in our area. Um, right now, uh, a lot of uh, poultry farmers in our area go to northern Illinois for inspected poultry processing, and a few go up to northern Minnesota. I know a handful of people who have quit raising poultry altogether because uh, when KB Poultry the last USDA inspected uh, processing facility in our area. Uh, last year they closed permanently um, and then a lot of people just 
decided to stop raising chickens altogether. So um, check my notes here. Anyways, uh, thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Well, thank you, Mr. Gardner. And if you would uh, uh, stay close uh, when we get done with the testimony, then we'll take questions. So next uh, testifier, we have a Sabrina Portner. Sabrina, are you with us? I am, can you hear me? We sure can. Great, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Sabrina Portner. I'm a graduate research fellow with the Minnesota Farmers Union. And I'm here to share my strong support for Senator Friend's bill to fund a meat processing certification navigator. I became involved with the meat processing work um, through MFU due to my interest in um, sustaining my own family farm. I grew up on a 200 cow dairy farm in Sleepy Eye, Minnesota. And I also have uh, four sisters, three to four of us are interested in being involved in that farm in the future. And um, being able to support my generation um, means that we are looking into diversifying the farm. My sister and I would like to raise dairy beef and hopefully eventually direct market that beef to our community. And with calves um, looking to be born in October, we're already anticipating the struggles that there might be in lining up processing for those um, animals, especially as new producers. So my work with MFU on livestock processing, as well as my graduate studies in forages and grazing is all geared towards helping to build these vital resilient farming communities um, for both my home farm and across Minnesota. What I've learned in my work with MFU uh, through my conversations with processors, with members, um, even a local farm family that's looking to start up a processing plant is just as Jim said, the sheer complexity to starting up or expanding a plant. It has a lot of moving parts and definitely requires help and support. A certification navigator could um, do just that for meat processors. It could go a long way to make this a, a smoother process. And um, as noted before, during COVID, we, uh, especially during COVID, we saw that the state inspection staff had worked to help processors become equal to inspected. And we'd like to build on that good work um, from the ins inspection staff and help more processors start businesses or expand um, through this uh, the help of a certification navigator, hopefully also addressing then the bottleneck in processing that are experienced by livestock producers, um, both myself and um, others in my community. So thank you for the opportunity to share some thoughts on behalf of myself and the Minnesota Farmers Union and to Senator Frentz for bringing this bill forward. And I'm happy to stay for any questions. Thank you, uh, Ms. Porter. Um, if you can stick around, we'll get our next testifier and then we'll open it up for questions if, if that would work for you. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Sarah Schub, are you with us, Sarah? And uh, welcome. If you can identify yourself for the record, that, that'd be great. You may begin. Hello, Mr. Chair, committee. Thank you all for having me today. I'm also here as a member of Land Stewardship Project to share my enthusiastic support. I think having a navigator is really essential. Um, as a small business owner, uh, I run a business called Cannon Valley Butcher's Block. So I provide organic pastured pork, butchery education classes, uh, mobile slaughter butcher services, and consulting services to my community. And as someone who has touched on the meat processing industry in a lot of different ways, I think you've heard a couple stories here about very specific startup constraints. Um, I'd like to kind of broaden the view for, for how this can be impactful in the industry. You know, there are obvious constraints to and bottlenecks within our meat processing industry and if we're going to try to make change there we really need to increase the number of operating plants and increase our slaughter capacity specifically so having a navigator would be an excellent way to streamline the process 
as someone who's worked with the MDA, everyone is wonderful and super supportive, but sometimes it can be difficult to find the right person or to even understand what questions you should be asking. So once you get to the point of trying to start a plant, you need to have someone help you with HACCP and SOP documentation and how to even go through the process of gaining that grant of inspection. And a navigator would allow someone to get the help that they need from the MDA by streamlining the process of, of who to speak to and what questions to ask and how to actually check all those boxes so that we can have more plants who want to start new operations, expand their operation, change their grant of inspection, actually move through that process faster and prevent people from stalling out or giving up and having more success in actually bringing on more processing capacity. Thank you for having us here and for considering the bill. Look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Ms. Shub. Uh, members, questions? Or maybe I sent her friends. I think, believe that's the end of your witnesses. Is there anybody else, or testifiers? Is there anybody else you had? No, Mr. Chair. Very good. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator French, you in line 1.8 says a full time certif certification navigator position. And then it says, uh, at um, 1.11, a one-time appropriation. Uh, why just only a one-time appropriation for this position? Well, Senator Prince. thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Senator Anderson. Uh, I, I'm not opposed to you know, endowing, if you will, a full-time position. I think our thought was this is a position that we're creating. It was not included in the Department of Agriculture's budget. I think it's a good idea. I appreciate the co-authorship that's bipartisan and I'm bringing it to the committee to see what all of you think. I'm sort of assuming that we're going to lay it over and you know that always paves the way for some conversation about the funding timing and mechanism. So that's my long winded way of saying uh, that was what I thought might be the easiest path to see if, if a certification position would work. Senator Anderson, any follow? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Senator Friends, this uh, navigator position, you see it in meeting all of agricultural's needs friends mr chair I, I think my view is there's some of this going on at the department of agriculture now so we don't have all the meat and poultry processors saying hey we can't get any help but we don't have it in the job description of a uh, mda employee now and so what this bill says is all right we're going to create someone who's going to help again not just the existing processors but in my view the, the class of entrepreneurs who are thinking about getting started um, and, and given that I see the MDA staff as, I'll use the term, fully employed already, this creates the most space and also a little bit of specialization. That's what I thought anyway, and I think that's the spirit of the bill. Senator Anderson, any follow-up? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Senator Friends, it, it basically, though, it says the position, it says a position would support meat and poultry processors. Um, so I'm looking to see if that, you're looking to expand that just instead of just those processes or you're looking at a, a bigger uh, definition? Senator Friends. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. The part that I think is expanded is the outreach part. So what we would hope would happen is that there's a position that can also go to processors and help them with ongoing compliance as opposed to just the initial certification. And the outreach part, as I understand it, is the part that uh, would be of the greatest benefit to our state's meat and poultry processors. So I again acknowledge that Department of Agriculture has some support for certification now. There's not a separate navigator position, but in particular what they're not really doing is, um, or I should say not to the extent the bill contemplates, is sort of going out to this 260, 241 meat and 53 poultry processors sort of saying, hey, listen, this is what compliance is needed. This is where USDA makes a difference. This is the certification and the safety and health and all that. So the outreach part is an expansion. So Mr. Chair, Senator Anderson. So Senator Friends, have you had conversation with the department on this? 
I have them right over my left shoulder and had a conversation not that long ago. Um, <laughs> and I would assume that commissioner would come and uh, speak to it again. I acknowledge it's not in the proposal from the Department of Agriculture. So uh, Senator Anderson, I'd welcome the department to step forward and share with this great committee. Senator Anderson, you want uh, would the just briefly, just briefly. Yes. Okay. Commissioner Peterson, uh, would you please come forward? Welcome, Commissioner. I, you know the routine. Identify yourself for the record, Senator Anderson. Uh, well, I guess from what I just asked Senator Frentz, uh, if, if the commissioner could expand on whether this is something that has been in the planning or is this something that you would have to develop and and uh, further define in a, a larger sense. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Chairman and uh, uh, Senator Anderson, I almost said Representative Anderson. But, uh, Senator Anderson, uh, and known you a long time, but uh, the, um, you know, it's a great question. Uh, again, Tom Peterson, Commissioner of Agriculture, and, you know, we support the concept of this idea. We do have staff that's not necessarily dedicated to this, but um, that does uh, answer these calls. Kind of how it works, too, is, um, you know, this was the meat processing, as you're well aware of, and the committee put a lot of dollars and thank you uh, last budget into this we really worked to address this with the legislature and the administration was a problem before COVID and then COVID really accelerated as people started buying locally more uh, and uh, we've seen um, a tremendous interest just in my phone calls that I get of people saying oh I want to start a locker I had somebody call me yesterday that wants to start a butcher shop and uh, you know and so um, what we do then is I send them to our person who's uh, very good uh, at kind of walking him through that, but he's got a, other things that he does and is very busy, but I can just tell you the interest is really strong right now, and I think it'll continue to be strong. My, my other just thought on this is that it is a one-time uh, appropriation, so, and I, I understand that too, so we'd be, you know, starting uh, hiring somebody, and then we could use that to see how it goes, and uh, do it that way or um, you know or we could come back if it's great in our budget you know next year and uh, try to make it permanent too but I, I do think that there's uh, you know very good uh, interest for this so I think it would complement a lot of the work that we're doing and uh, you know and it would be welcome so um, we have permitted uh, or started uh, several new plants we do have Dr. Neeser too who uh, uh, is on the call too uh, if we have more specific questions. Senator Anderson. Well, thank you. I appreciate the testimony from the department. And uh, I know we're laying this bill over. Is that correct, Mr. That, Chair? That's correct, Senator. Maybe we can work on details uh, between now and whenever we come up with our final Sen bill. Senator Frentz, uh, I'm going I'm to say this with some air quotes, uh, Commissioner and <laughs> Senator Frentz, but uh, is, it, is the Department of Agriculture really that complicated that we have to hire a new position just to navigate it? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair, I propose to tackle that question first. Um, not so much a question of complexity, but capacity. I think what the commissioner is saying is kind of what I hear in my district. A lot of interest in people saying, hey, maybe we'd get into processing. Maybe you'd open a business. Um, and so I think the staff at MDA is outstanding. That's no big secret. But the position as it's envisioned would be um, sort of dedicated to the navigating of the certification process. And the sure. commissioner is much nicer than I am, yes. but some of the certification issues, you know, it's, uh, public safety, health, um, pretty pretty complex already. Sure, and, and commissioner, you don't have to answer that <laughs> question. Right. No, but I would add too, though, that, you know, there are the, one of the testifiers mentioned the HACCP rules. Uh, that is something that we do get, uh, and that is a federal uh, piece too, but we do help, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, try to steer people through that, try to provide them resources, uh, you know, and so there, it is there, it depends on your capacity. And if you're new to it, or if you've been involved in a, something before, there's different levels of expertise getting into it. So, so, so Commissioner Peterson, uh, and I'll start with you, but how, um, I'm, I'm looking at the budget. Uh, we, last year we passed, uh, some areas of new market development, uh, value added, uh, grants, uh, how, how come they wouldn't fit into some of this for poultry or other market development? Uh, it seems to me that they, they could fit right into that same uh, arena, that same category that we've already have programs funded for. So what, what would make this different or why, why wouldn't 
this rise to the top in an, in an application if if somebody's trying to start uh, poultry processing uh, as a again value added opportunity. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, two points I'd like to make on that. Those grants, and they're open right now, we did do one round, and then we have a second round open right now. And uh, those are uh, very heavily based on equipment, uh, you know, and, and physical. Uh, they're not on like uh, technical assistance and personnel, things like that, or trying to help through this. That's how I see this more. This That is more like I need a slicer, I need a new concrete floor, I need something like that. That's what those grants help. And what we found out when we had, uh, you know, uh, some CARES dollars in the fall of 2020, uh, that we had a very short time window, we tried to turn around and uh, some of the people would say, I'd love to do that and I'd love to do the money, but A, I don't have the time and I don't have the employees uh, and I need some help doing it, you know? And so it was really interesting. So that's why I was saying like, I could see this being like a compliment to that. And then I'd also like to say too, I think, and Dr. Neeser's on too, but I think that, you know, I think what she's told me we've started, I think 15 new uh, uh, operations in the last year or, uh, or so. So I think that we are getting those new ones uh, up and running, but there's, like I said, tremendous interest right now. So, Mr. Uh, or Commissioner Peterson, thank you. Why don't we uh, have uh, Dr. Neeser yeah, uh, that'd be great. chime in on that? If you, Dr. Neeser, if you're with us, could you identify yourself for the record and uh, uh, follow up on, on that question and comments? Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Westrom and Senators. Uh, Dr. Nicole Neeser, I'm the director of our uh, meat, in uh, meat inspection program at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Um, I think the key um, point here is that um, I think that has already been made is that some of this work is already done by inspection staff. And so um, the grants and other monies that go through um, those programs, as the commissioner mentioned, are typically for uh, facilities, uh, equipment, sort of infrastructure. Um, I believe there are some opportunities for folks to pay for, say, a consultant, but the real fact of the matter is there really aren't consultants out there. <laughs> so to help people navigate the regulations. And so um, basically what we find is that our inspectors, whose primary job is to inspect uh, for food safety, also find themselves spending a significant amount of time helping um, prospective or new establishments kind of trying to navigate the, the regulations, which are admittedly complex. You know, we have a, a federal system that for these small plants, that isn't always a great fit for them. And it is a bit of a challenge sometimes to get through. And with some help, I think a lot of them can get through it. But, um, you know, we, 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 we rely on our inspectors to help. Um, and uh, frankly, we love to do that. However, it does take away from the time that those staff need to do, need to do inspections. Um, this bill would um, actually allow us to take someone with a significant amount of expertise, probably an inspector or someone very close to the inspection program and assist these plants directly and then free up inspectors to do inspections um, uh, more as a bigger percentage of their job. Um, again, we, we love doing this. Um, I think you know we wanna help these plants be successful. It's just a matter of getting enough resources out there and outreach to, to help them. Very good, thank you, Dr. Neeser. Other questions, members? Doesn't look like it. Uh, Senator French, uh, do you wanna just offer uh, any final final words and uh, then we'll lay the bill over for possible inclusion? I appreciate that, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate you hearing the bill. Thanks again to the co-authors. I think this follows our theme that we're trying to grow agriculture and businesses. And this is one of the things we can do is help new businesses get started. And we can help our existing processing businesses. I know we haven't got a target yet, so I appreciate the chance to kind of put it out there and see what happens. Thanks again, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Friends. Actually, Commissioner Peterson, before you go, I want to further follow up. Just how, how would, how does this square with, I understand the department is short of money uh, with some of the grocery inspectors and some of the on-site inspections. Uh, uh, if we add this position, uh, what, what's, what's that gonna look like uh, in the big picture? Uh, or is that something that is just not, not, uh, not likely to happen with grocery inspectors being uh, delegated or cut back on? 
Uh, Mr. Chair, yeah, it would be, uh, it's kind of a separate issue, you know, I think in a different division, different area, um, you know, and so I don't, I think it's kind of a different issue that we would have to look at. Our, our federal, our um, meat inspection too is tied to some federal programs to it. So it's kind of a different type situation. So okay. another, again, another issue that we, you know, are trying to address and work on, uh, but it, it you know, um, would be somewhat separate from this. I, I'm not sure how we could tie them together, it, but we could look at that. Okay, and Commissioner, at this point, just to be clear, this is not part of the governor's budget proposal uh, at, at this Correct. time. Correct, Mr. Chair. Okay, very good. Any other questions, members? Otherwise, uh, the bill is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Senator French. Thank, Thank you, Commissioner Peters. Thank you again, Mr. Chair and members. Um, members, uh, next bill, uh, Senator Jasinski. Senate file 2537, uh, Senator uh, Goggin will uh, move 2537 uh, for consideration and uh, to be laid over for possible inclusion in the om Ag Omnibus Bill. Senator Jasinski, uh, tell us about your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's the uh, second time this year I've been in front of the Ag Committee, so it's great to be here. Uh, Senate file 2537, uh, thank you for hearing this bill. Uh, it updates the Greater Minnesota Ag Land Preservation Program. Uh, that uh, program takes place in uh, three counties, Wasika, Winona, and Wright. So I'm bringing this on behalf of Wasika County. Uh, Minnesota, as you well know, is an agricultural state, and we have created tools for the protection of land suited for our state national and international food production. One of those tools is the Ag Land Preservation Program. The counties participating in the program are doing so in the interest of promoting agriculture and encouraging growth of their local economies. This proposal is meant to assist the program in achieving both of these goals. Wasika County Commissioner D. Malter is here to tell you more about the program with this proposal. Very good, thank you, uh, Senator Jasinski and uh, uh, D. Malter. Yes. Welcome to our committee. Uh, identify yourself for the record and uh, you may proceed. Tell us, tell us about the bill or why you support the bill. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. Uh, I am Dee Malter, Wasika County Commissioner. Um, I'm also speaking on behalf of the Association of Minnesota Counties, uh, a membership association that represents all 87 Minnesota counties. Thank you for hearing Senate File 2537, which makes some adjustments to the Minnesota Ag Land Preservation Program. Ag Land Preservation is an important effort. And this program is one of the tools that we have to accomplish the goal. We believe the program would benefit from some updates. Um, first, I'd like to provide a little background for you. Uh, a brief history. This program began in the metro area, actually, in 1980. Um, it was paid for and continues to be paid for by a surcharge on mortgages and deeds. $2.50 goes to the Commissioner of Revenue and $2.50 of that $5 surcharge go into a special conservation account in the County General Revenue Fund. The county funds are used to offset the cost of the conservation tax credit that is given to property owners, rural land or landowners. Um, the amount of the credit in the Metro system is derived from a formula that uses land values so the tax credit fluctuates with the value of the land. In exchange for the tax credit, landowners sign an, a, uh, a covenant that restricts the land to agricultural and forestry uses. It does provide some protection from um, sub-regulations that make it easier to, to keep it in ag and forestry. Um, and um, a significant part of this program is that there is an eight year requirement for with for removal, you have to give eight year notice in order to re, to remove ground from this um, program. This program moved out state in 1984 there was a pilot program in which five counties uh, took part. And the pilot ended in 1987 with three counties establishing um, ag preservation programs Wasika, Winona and Wright counties. Um, this program really does help provide protection for ag land. Um, it it um, helps uh, to avoid some regulation that might restrict farming practices. It protects from annexation. It protects from eminent domain movements. 
Um, there are good reasons why this program is in place um, and why it should, um, it should serve more people than it does. There are some significant differences between the Metro version and the outstate version. Um, the outstate version has a flat $1.50 uh, per acre tax credit per year. Um, and there is a parcel size, uh, a minimum parcel size in the rural program of 35 acres, which is a substantial piece of ground. Um, since this has been put in place, there also have been updates to the Metro version, which do allow for earlier withdrawal than the eight year period. That, has not, that change has not been made in the rural program. I'd like to show you what this means for Waseca County. Um, Waseca County has 276,000 plus acres and 93.8% of those acres are A1 ag. We are the definition of an ag county. Um, almost 80,000 acres of those are in the ag preservation program. So more than 30% of our A1 ag acres are in ag preservation. Why does this matter? Because since 1987, times have changed. Land values in rural Minnesota have changed drastically since the farm crisis of the 1980s. I know, because I lived through them. Um, and, and there hasn't even been a change in this program to account for inflation. If we were looking at, at um, that $1.50 in today's dollars, we'd be looking at $3.85 with inflation built in. Um, banking practices have changed a lot, partly as a result of the, the farm crisis. Um, Banks want parcels split off. If you're gonna build a house, if you're gonna put up a confinement building, if you're going to uh, put in uh, uh, cattle, um, if you're gonna put up a big grain setup, bankers want those, those facilities to be on a separate parcel of ground and they don't want any covenants on it, um, which that's standard banking practices these days. So if somebody wants to put up a new, new house in the country, this can stifle that. All they have to do is wait eight years to do it. Um, conservation philosophies and practices have changed a lot too. Farmers are, are being even better stewards of the ground and they're seeing um, new and increased uses for ground that used to be considered marginal or they're coming up with, with new income streams in rural areas that we would like to be able to encourage. One thing that is different about um, this program as opposed to most other covenants, most covenants on property end after 30 years. We're 35 years into the rural uh, ag preservation um, program and these covenants are, are permanent. So there's no changing it. Once you're in, if you wanna get out, you better plan for eight years. And once again, there are, there are numerous uh, new ideas for how to make money in the rural. Um, pizza farms, breweries. I have both of those in my small district in Waseca County and it's awesome. Another example of this would be solar. Um, I share with you this slide that shows um, a comparison a 10 acre piece of property um, in production ag with the, the ag preservation credit applied over 25 years would be an income of, of $75,375. If that same, same rural property owner leased that ground to a solar company, it would be $250,000 of income. There's a lot of of farmers that view this as a great income stream that would very much complement the crazy markets that they deal with in both livestock and commodities. And it takes up a relatively small footprint. This program um, is intensive to run on a county level. The Ag Preservation Program in its current form is challenging to administer. And if we're gonna do something hard, let's make it as valuable as possible. If we're committed to ag preservation, then let's make changes to the program that make it more flexible, 
and might make it and might make it expand. Those changes are worth considering. Senate file 2537 um, could, could strengthen this program. Our Minnesota rural counties are gonna continue to value what happens on the land and, and be good stewards of it. What, what we would like to see happen is to allow solar facilities up to meg one megawatt as accessory, um, accessory uses on, in um, egg preservation ground. This would be added to the list of allowed commercial and industrial uses. Very small acreages on the farm could lend significant and, um, accessory income to farming operations this way. The other change that we'd like to see that would come out of this bill is an adjustment to the withdrawal period from eight years down to three years. This allows opportunities to strengthen our communities. Um, people can build houses, put up um, hog barns or cattle facilities or grain setups or other, other things without having to plan eight years out. Um, this also would, would really help with the generational shift that is happening in rural Minnesota. I know, because I'm of an age, where um, our, our farm is being, being transitioned to the next generation. Having to plan eight years out for some of the pieces of property can be really complex and make that a much more difficult process than it needs to be. Um, a lesser requirement for, for withdrawal could also draw new people into the program. This is a valuable program. It, it does help protect ag land, but the eight year withdrawal period, I think really keeps a lot of people from enrolling that otherwise might be interested and might, might really benefit from it. I really appreciate your time today and I would stand for any questions. Thank you, uh, Ms. Malter. Uh, one question I've got, the eight years, do you know any of the background of why they picked eight years and uh, any, any information on that? And uh, I personally don't, and I don't know if Brian from AMC has any insight for us. Um, as I said, part of what shaped this program is that it was put in place in the 1980s. And anybody who farmed in the 1980s knows what an ugly time that was. Um, people were just trying to hang on to their ground. And so a buck 50 an acre felt like a big win. <laughs> and eight years didn't seem like that long a time because boy, if, there, if I can do this for eight years, I can make it. Um, so I don't, because I wasn't involved at that time. Senator Dames. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Madam Commissioner. Just a question on your example showing the ag land rent. Uh, so if you put this in this, people would put this in the program for eight years, okay? Mm -hmm. How were they, were they paid up front on any of that or was it paid equally over every year? What kind of a payment? How was those payment? How were those payments made? The, the tax credit? Ms. Malter. The tax credit, explain to me how the tax credit worked. The tax credit is paid yearly. And, and what happens is they pay their property taxes and then they get a check back from the county that reimburses them for the tax credit. And that would only be on the acres that they put into this preserve, is that correct? That is correct. Ms. Walter. Yes, I'm sorry. Yep. Senator Dames. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So when they, put this, uh, let's say they take it out and put it into this, a solar garden, then the tax credit, does that stop or does that continue? Ms. Malter? I think it would depend uh, in which, specifically how the language changed for this. Our, our ask is that solar be allowed on, on uh, small solar gardens, one megawatt or less. Um, I, I don't know that, that it would necessarily be a problem to, to say you've got to withdraw that. What makes this complicated is if you've got a, um, if you've got a, a piece of property that's 37 um, acres and you want to take five acres out for a solar garden, um, 
right now, nothing can happen on that for eight years. And if you do decide to take it out, um, you're gonna be below the 35 acre threshold. So the, the threshold of 35 acres bumps up against the, um, the use. Um, so sometimes you, we've had solar gardens that have been placed on better farm ground than they should have been or, or placed in less than desirable places because that's where that property owner could put it that wasn't ag preservation. And, and I don't think property owners would be against losing the tax credit on, on the, the, the part that goes into a solar farm. Uh, in fact, when you look at the, the payback, that's not gonna be an issue. I think that's the mechanics to figure out. And I trust that you all are pros at that and can do it. Follow up, Mr. Senator Chair. Dames. So is this program still available? Ms. Malter? It is. So will you be changing the acres that need to be put in to make it qualify for future? If, the, if it's changed to allow solar, then are you gonna adjust the acres? What will you do there? Will that still stay at 35 or will you adjust it accordingly? Ms. Malter? This proposal does not, does not suggest any changes to the acreage. The increase in flexibility and timing and, and allowing solar is really the flexibility that we're looking for. Um, property owners that have, that have land in ag preservation, between those two things, that would give them so much more flexibility. So Ms. Um, Malter yes. uh, and, and Senator Jasinski, we kind of at the root of this is to add in these specified solar structures, similar to how a building or other exemption exceptions are already allowed. That's, that's the reason for the exception you're asking for here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, that is correct. Uh, already uh, wireless communications are allowed in these areas. So we're just adding the solar fields and then reducing the number of withdrawal period of notice from eight years to three years. I'm not changing the 35 acres. It's just reducing the notice period from eight to three and allowing solar gardens of up to one megawatt. And Senator Dames, do you have a follow up? Otherwise, I was gonna follow up on that. Uh, thank you. You're good, okay. So, so Senator Jasinski, uh, why why reduce the years if we just grant the exception then they could continue to stay in the ag preservation program couldn't they uh thank you mr chair uh, again the, the concern is eight years is a long time for planning purposes okay. uh, three years gives much more flexibility uh, as commissioner malter said you're seeing transitions from farmers to their children uh, eight years not knowing what they could do the changing economics of, of all these things it just gives more flexibility from going eight years to three years for planning purposes so, so Senator Jasinski, uh, I'm almost seeing these as mutually exclusive issues, although they they work hand in hand. But if if we made the exception, for instance, and didn't change the eight to the three, your bill still would accomplish uh, largely what you're trying to do, which is allow these structures on this designated land. Is that correct or am I missing something? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, it, it would be accomplishing half of what we're looking for because both items are very important. Yeah. Uh, the flexibility and allow these uh, these type of uh, arrays or, or megawatt or uh, solar fields. So really, I think they're both equally important and I'll, I'll turn it to the commissioner on that. Uh, I'm not the expert on it, but I in with Seek Accounting because she deals with it more and more, but I think both are really equally as, as important. So I'd like to, Commissioner Malter to, to answer that, please. Ms. Ms. Malter. Thank you, Senator Jasinski and Chair. Um, really, these issues are not mutually exclusive. They are both um, important to, to economic development in a very rural county. Um, as a property owner and, and as a farmer who moved to town not that many years ago, um, I know when it comes to estate planning and trying to figure out how to get the next generation into farming, um, and, and how to make that happen. Having to wait eight years to, to see some of those plans come to fruition is, can be very difficult. You're asking us to take out a crystal ball that's, that's way further down the road than, than most people have to plan for. 
if um, a three-year window allows you to respond to the economics of the time, it, it allows you to, even post-COVID days these days, we can look out three years and go, well, we think this is going to happen. Who the heck knows what's going to happen in eight years? Um, my husband is 72. Um, if I had property that I was concerned about moving sideways and he, his health hasn't been the best, I don't have a chance to do that and, and not have it affect his estate planning very significantly. So the solar pieces is, is one thing for people who are looking for that ancillary uh, income stream on rural properties right now. But there's multiple reasons why that withdrawal period, that additional flexibility would be a great thing, including that we could draw extra acres into this if people knew that, they, that it didn't have to stay in for eight years. For a buck 50 an acre, that, that is, that is not, a, that's not a trade-off that most, most rural property owners want to make these days anymore because we're not in the middle of a farm crisis. Ms. Ms. Malter, so, so to the question though, um, the, the, the eight to three mm -hmm. versus the solar exception, Am, am I missing something that the, they're they're both mutually exclusive? We could give you one and not the other. Pick pick whichever. And I'm not suggesting this. I'm just wanting to make sure I understand. I don't I don't see where the solar array is connected to going to three years. Mr. Chair, what I'm hearing you say is the three years is a good policy because it would give landowners and everybody more flexibility. So, so I think that seems like a, a, good, a good change potentially, but it, it doesn't matter whether we, the solar exception is made or not. Is, am I understanding that correct? Or Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, you're absolutely correct. Uh, the two are not tied to each other. These are just two changes that they would like to see change, uh, done to improve the program. So, and, and that's what I wanted to just make sure I was, we were understanding correctly, Senator Chesinski. Thank you, Mr. Um, Chair. You are absolutely I, correct. I, I wasn't asking to indicate maybe one looked good and one didn't. I'm just okay. wanting to, make, but but it does beg the question. I don't. So far, we haven't heard that it needs to go to taxes. Um, do you know anything different, Senator Jasinski, on on that aspect? It would be my only question. I, I don't want to purport that that's the case, but uh, if it was, it it would could make that part of the bill a little more complicated. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do not know where the where it will go to next. I think I'll leave that up to staff to under, uh, describe where it's going. Okay. Senator Dames has another question. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Madam Commissioner. So the dollar and a half an acre that they get, that's only on the number of acres in the preserve program. Is that right? So you have somebody that has eight to ten thousand dollar land. And they're going to put that in a preserve program for a buck and a half a year per acre. Why would you even have such a program? Seriously, with the work that you have to do to keep that program in place, I don't even understand why you have it. We shouldn't even be having this conversation. Because if you're going to give somebody a buck and a half, and like you said, it's hard to see out in that window. But yet on the other hand, when they put it in there, they knew what that window was. It's no different than putting land in the CRP or CREP, other than there's a different payment process. But if you want to take land out of CREP or CRP, you cannot do that unless you pay everything back. And I'm not suggesting that that happened here, not at all. But I do really question why that program is still in place at a dollar and a half an acre and why somebody would put their land, even if it's low value land, why they would put their land into that and why you as a county would be encouraging this. I guess I'm a little mystified because I can certainly understand why Senator Jasinski brought this bill because there certainly is some, some issues and there's an inequity on fairness here, but uh, I'm not so sure why we're uh, continuing the program. I, I guess I'd need an explanation of to who's really benefiting from that. Ms. Ms. Malter, any Thank you, Senator. Thought on that? Yes, many. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Senator. We've, we, we have certainly had those discussions. Um, and um, 
this bill is an attempt to, to get us some additional flexibility so that the folks who are in the program have more flexibility to make decisions on their property than they do now. The, the question of whether this program should even exist is a, is a much larger question. And part of it um, in discussions I've had with folks come down to legality. They signed a permanent easement. Can the state just decide, well, you signed a permanent easement and we're just gonna do away with it? That's something for, for the folks on your level to decide. I just know that my, my rural property owners are looking for changes to this program so that they can, so that they have additional flexibility and can make better decisions for their rural property and, and a better, more reliable income stream. As far as um, whether the program should exist, there are plenty of days when quite frankly, I wouldn't mind if it went away. Um, our planning and zoning office struggles with this on a very regular basis. Our auditor treasurer's office spends a lot of time on it. There's a lot of resources in a small rural county that go to running this program, but because we're in it, we're in it. And, and when you're in the middle of the river swimming, you grab onto the log that's closest. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Senator Dames. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the explanation. County commissioner to county commissioner. <laughs> so my question is, so you say that they're still getting that, those dollars. So if you put a piece of land in for eight years, how long do you get that tax subsidy? Ms. Malter. As long as you leave the, the property enrolled. It's, Ms. Malter, so, so you, if you can repeat, so, so the program, you put, you put the land in the ag preserve and the benefit is you get, do you get a lower tax rate on top of the dollar fifty credit, or, no. or explain that a little bit more, and then Senator Dames maybe has a follow up. But I'm uh, sure also uh, Commissioner uh, Peterson may also want to make some comments on it as well. So okay. I'd open it up for him as well to answer some of the questions. Okay, thank you. No, uh, the the tax credit is the benefit to the property owner. That and and those protections that I talked about earlier. Um, the um, protection from some regulations that might make it difficult to farm. Um, some protection from annexation or from eminent domain. And of course, those, those were built in because this was built on the Metro program. So um, that's some of the, I, I think some of the washover that came because it was built on a pre-existing program that was designed for Metro area. Oh, I see. Senator Dames, and then we'll ask Commissioner Peterson for. Uh, well, I, I think comment. it'd be good to hear from Commissioner Peterson because I, I Unless it's the the options that the, the protections that was built in, then I understand that's a whole different program. And so then I would question, you know, if, if this protections are going to last for as long as they have the land in the program, then if it was eight years, I'm not so sure that that should be changed back to three because you're, you, when they agreed to do this, it wasn't a dollar and a half they were probably looking at. It was the protections against these other things that you listed. Would I be fair in that comment? Ms. Malter? Um, I think it was a combination of things. I think in the Metro program, those protections were first and foremost. I think when the program moved out state, that certainly they were valuable. Um, and in the 1980s during the farm crisis, there was a lot of concern about people coming out and doing all kinds of things out in rural Minnesota and building all kinds of things and, and changing the landscape for rural Minnesota. Um, and, I, and so I think those, those were seen as valuable to prevent that kind of scenario from happening because people were really afraid then. Um, but that hasn't happened and, and there are, if, if folks who have concerns about that happening, this is a perfect program. If they have property that's close to a developing city, um, this is a great program that, that would help them continue to farm and, and not 
um, not deal with some of those, those threats to their operation. But, but really, I think the buck and a half an acre was a big deal in, in the mid 1980s. I, I do, I was first married and had little kids and we were farming then. And we didn't eat at McDonald's, we couldn't afford to. A buck and a half an acre was a big deal. I'll wait to hear Commissioner Peterson. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, and thank you for having this discussion today. Again, Tom Peterson, Commissioner of the Department of Agriculture, and I go way back with this issue, 20 some years uh, when I first started working here, um, used to work on this a lot. Uh, a lot of you remember uh, Senator Steve Dills, some of you served with him. Uh, urban sprawl was a really big thing for him. You're losing farmland, you know, we looked at, we're losing, you remember the, the, the times we were losing 50 acres a day, we're uh, looking at this. So it was a really big issue why, you know, this was put in place and it's not something we talk about a lot. One of the things I just want to say kind of happened to in this program with the Metro program and everything was, you know, in, in 2008, I worked on it quite a bit. Um, there were people that really cared deeply about this program who are really not with us anymore. And then 2008, we had the housing, uh, you know, kind of downhill where we uh, and kind of the interest in this program or boosting it or working on it kind of went away for a while because we weren't worried about urban sprawl anymore. Uh, you know, but I, I do think as we look and you look as a committee and consider what our options are to preserve farmland, we're talking a lot about access for farmland and everything else, but we're losing farmland again uh, as our economy starts to pick up and we see people start to grow. So this is one of the tools we've had in the toolbox um, you know, for quite a while. But being that, I would say that the interesting thing about this bill and what the commissioners brought up, and, and I've really evolved somewhat on this eight years to three years um, in looking at the program as a whole. Again, we've had this program in place for, is it 35 years? Would that be right? It is correct. You know, and so originally there were five counties. Uh, uh, two of the counties opted out. I think it was Douglas and Candy Ojai didn't want to, you know, uh, do this uh, and different things. As I would, when I was in my earlier career, I would say, why aren't there more counties doing this? You know, and why in our staff at, at the time, the department staff would go out, try to sell it to the counties. Counties just wouldn't uh, look at this. And so one of the things, you know, we've kind of looked at, and I always was hardcore on the eight years. I said that, you know, that's a minimum of the commitment we should have. But over the years, I just have kind of evolved and has that kind of been a deterrent to doing this. And so I think this is an important discussion to have. And so um, I think it's something that, you know, we should consider looking at. On the solar too, I think uh, evolved on that too, that this is something also that we would support the department and looking at that. Keep in mind one megawatt is about 10 acres. So you're not talking about, you know, a huge expanse or anything. This is a, a newer, a piece that would work on that. And then Mr. Chair, um, if nothing else comes to this, this was something that when I first became commissioner, I had great ideas. This was one thing I wanted to look at. I wanted to really get into this because like I said, the program really hasn't grown much. And we did have a legislative audit uh, a few years ago that you could take a look at on the whole program. And we also do have a legislative report that we could share with all of you. I think we just got it here uh, March 1st and we could share that with you. And Mr. Chair, if you would indulge like just a two more minutes, uh, we do have our uh, agency planner who works on this. And he, I think would have some really good comments for the committee is uh, Mr. Zastapil, Bestapil. And I think he is on the line if, if he had a couple of minutes. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, uh, Mr. Zas Zasafil. Zastapil, yep. Yeah. Uh, welcome to yes. our committee. If you can identify yourself, uh, we do have we do have a few more minutes. Uh, I think this is a, an insightful conversation to be having. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Are you able to hear me? Uh, fairly well. Try getting a little closer. It might oh, sure. just improve okay. it a, a slight bit. Sure. So, uh, hi everyone. My name is Mike Zastapol. I am the Agricultural and Food System Planner, new to the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Um, as Commissioner Peterson was saying. Uh, we don't see any significant issues with this bill. Obviously, the reduction from eight to three years uh, would you know, have the land uh, preserved for less time. But again, that could be a barrier. We haven't seen any new enrollments in this program since it began, at least in the Greater Minnesota program. Um, so that could be a, a way to increase enrollment. Specifically for the solar, solar panels, uh, yeah, again, one megawatt is about 10 acres. We're not seeing a significant reduction in farmland with this. Um, and it's also possible for 
uh, solar energy to be used in tandem with farmland. Uh, it's possible for the two to coexist. Uh, there are plenty of projects that benefit pollinators, uh, you know, using uh, pollinator habitat uh, to conserve the soil and promote agriculture around solar panels. So we don't see any significant issues with this and see it as a way to update the program. So uh, with that, that's all I have. Thank you, Chair. So, Mr. Zasafil, um, so, so you work with counties if, if they want to uh, enroll this program. Um, just bear with me for a second here. I'm trying to connect some dots. And, and Commissioner, uh, both commissioners, this program is beneficial for farmland, uh, for uh, individuals or counties that want to uh, put more of that farmland, or ensure that farmland stays farmland and, and at least um, curb what might otherwise become development and, and eat up that farmland. I can see where it's more of a suburban metro focus, just except for maybe around a Mankato or a St. Cloud or a regional center. Um, but is, is the eight years primarily what probably does that preservation uh, because it is a pretty high bar to uh, commit your land, but once you get it, you've got a good chance of keeping farmland uh, in that area. And uh, can it be on farmland and other land that's just grassland and, and not farmed, or is, is, does it matter? Right. Mr. Zasifo? Sure. Um, I, it is for farmland or for land that is in agricultural use. It is, uh, that is the point of the agricultural preserves that is for agricultural use. I would have to get back to you uh, the exact definition, but that is in the statute. Um, and to your point about the eight years, whether that is the key factor of whether that actually preserves the farmland. I think that I, I can't speak to that, um, but again, I could get back to you uh, to see if we could look into that, if there's evidence of that. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Commissioner. Yeah, you know, too, and, and I also think, Mr. Or Mr. Chairman, members, I, I also think, too, that, you know, we do think of it as, you know, metro area, but you do look at, like, like Rochester, for sure, you know, in that area, or you mentioned St. Cloud, like, if if counties are concerned about this and, and areas like, you know, I think that we, as you know, we don't make new farmland, you know, and so I think that we're going to continue to have discussions about what are the steps or what are the programs we can take. And I just think that we are going to see continued growth in those regional centers as we've had. And so that's why I think it's, it's open to looking at whether eight years or three years or five years or something, but you know, the, the fact of the matter is I've looked at it is eight years, you know, 35 years we've had the program and we've had three counties, you know, and we have not added. We used to try, you know, and as Mr. Zastapol is, is new, the idea is that he would, you know, well uh, work and promote work with the counties to make them aware of this program. And, uh, you know, if they're interested in it, but, you know, frankly, we haven't, uh, we've stepped back from that, but I'd like to re-engage in that. Uh, as we are seeing more and more uh, uh, farmland lost in Minnesota, as long as we have the program. So, Commissioner Peterson, um, can you clarify the three counties? Is there only three counties that, that do this program right now, or, or, or what did you mean by that? And then Senator Dames and Senator Anderson. Yep. Correct, Mr. Chair. There's three counties. They're W's, <laughs> Wasika, Wright, and uh, Winona. God, it's like... That's, that's how I remember. So okay. there, and like I said, originally there was two others. This started as a pilot, uh, you know, and, and uh, Douglas and Candy Ohio were the other two and opted not to get into or continue with the pilot. And again, that was 30 some years ago. And then over the course of time, you know, I thought like Chisago County, uh, Isani County, we thought like some of these counties would be perfect for this program. And I went to meetings with them, but this is going back 15 years, you know, and and to be honest, we just kind of dropped it, you know, and, and uh, you know, but we are seeing continued growth in those counties. And we, you know, I think it's important to look at what are the other programs, not to get into a whole thing here, but we also have Green Acres, you know, which is a whole nother, you know, type of preservation program, you could argue that benefits those counties as well. And so again, getting really complicated, but we do have some tools, but that's the counties that we have. Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and Madam Commissioner. Can you tell me a 
about how many different uh, farmers are signed up for this program in Wasi County? Ms. Malter? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Approximate um, is close enough for government work. <laughs> let, let me, whoops. Yeah. Let me take a peek here in my notes because I did, did look at some of this. Um, I, I will preface this by saying Wasika County has more acres in Ag Preserve than any other rural county. Um, we have um, almost, we have over 79,000 um, acres. Senator Dames. Yes, and let me, oh, I've got some specifics about the parcels here, I believe. There are, um, there are 754 parcels. So Mr. Chair. Senator Dames. Madam Commissioner, so you're looking at what, uh, 100 acres of parcel? The average, um, the average acres is, um, is 81, 81, just over 81 acres. Yep. Okay. Senator Dames. Thank you. No follow-up. Senator Anderson. So, Senator Anderson, you've got the right county. Is there a wrong county too? <laughs> well, they both start with W. <laughs> I always thought right started with R, but uh, anyways, members uh, got to have a little humor too. Other questions, members? We're, uh, we're learning, we're learning in this committee today, members. So, uh, uh, hope, hope, uh, hope we can appreciate that. Um, so, um, Commissioner Peterson, uh, I'm just getting word from staff here that in addition to the three rural counties, it sounds like there maybe is some metro counties that are also part of the, the, the Ag Preserve. And, and I don't know if that's a distinction or a, a difference, um, uh, but it, do you, any any additional thoughts you have on that or clarifications? I, I we're just kind of learning pieces as we go here, Mr. Chairman and uh, um, members. That is correct. There's two different programs. So we've been kind of talking about the statewide egg preserve. Again, this is already complicated, uh, but we also have the metro area egg preserve program. That's a, a similar, but somewhat different program as well okay. too. And so that is in the seven county metro area. Uh, so you're like, you know, Ramsey, Hennepin, uh, Carver, uh, Scott, uh, those counties. Okay, okay, just just to help helpful distinction. But mm -hmm. interesting that we only have three counties that have subscribed to this. Um, now we know why you have the bill, Senator Jasinski, because uh, Douglas County has not uh, gone down this path. Uh, so, um, so, so I guess maybe a final question for Commissioner uh, Malter and uh, you, Senator Jasinski, but I mean, it does strike me that even adding this exception, whether we change the eight to five or three or, or six months, uh, we, the, 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 the solar structure would be maybe a helpful change to just allow a little more variation or option to keep that land in Ag Preserve. Uh, and that's the that's a big purpose of the bill here. Is that is that correct? As as things change, it's kind of just a, uh, a consistent, but but a, a different opportunity for for farmers or landowners to to uh, capture that opportunity, but also keep their land in in, in the intended use. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Yes, as you, we've all seen the the pop ups of these megawatt facilities or one megawatt facilities across our state has been pretty popular, uh, helps the farm farmers get uh, some more income than they're used to. So I think that's a big thing. And again, as Commissioner Malter said, that just gives some more flexibility. Uh, again, eight years is a long time for planning purposes. So I think three is somewhere between zero and eight, a little bit light on the three, uh, you know, towards the other side. But I, I think it's a, a happy medium, uh, but it's up to you, the discretion of this committee. If we need to alter that at all or have more input from the commissioner, uh, we're open to that, but uh, eight years is just seems like an awful long time for planning purposes. Okay, follow up and then Senator Dames has one more question. So Commissioner Walter, would, would it be your opinion that if, if the years were changed to three or four, and, and maybe you Commissioner Peterson too, do, do you see that as maybe a jump start or a rekindling of new interest in this program where otherwise people just uh, don't wanna go 
into that long of a commitment? Thank you, Chair and Committee. Yes, absolutely. Um, going back to the idea that um, that eight years is a long time if you're if you're going through a lot of changes, and there are a lot of changes happening to rural to rural properties um, these days. We are going through a generational shift, and there's going to be a lot of property, no matter what we do, there's going to be a lot of property that changes hands in the next 20 years. Lots, millions of acres, literally, because my generation isn't going to be here in 20. And so um, building in flexibility so that um, families can make wise decisions about how to do that, I really see that as, as an important reason to, to add more flexibility with, with a shorter withdrawal time here. There, there's a variety of reasons why this could jumpstart things. And, and I, really I really appreciated um, the commissioner's words about um, growth around cities, Rochester and Mankato. Um, you should know it, it only takes 15 minutes for me to drive into Mankato. I was there this morning before I came up here. Um, the big city isn't far down the road from me. Um, Owatonna is 25 minutes the other direction. We happen to be a very rural county in right between um, two what would be considered urban centers. And so ag preservation is an issue for our county. But because we want to preserve ag doesn't mean we want to lock our property owners in so that they don't have the flexibility that they need to make good decisions for their family farm. And so I, I think the, um, the intent of this bill is to help on both sides of that. It might grow the program. It still helps farmers um, and rural property owners preserve their, their land, but does so in a window that, that is more manageable. Very good. So Commissioner Peterson, any brief comment? Yep, Ms. Mr. Chairman and members, I just add that, you know, the more I've looked at this the last week and visited with our staff and everything, and again, I've worked on this for a long time, you know, and I, and I kind of gave up on it. You know, I kind of, you know, in 2008, it was like one of these issues where I, I just felt like we weren't getting anywhere. And, and that was 14 years ago. You know, we realized when I started talking to our staff about this. And uh, so that tells me too that, you know, we really haven't grown the program. We really haven't done much with it, that it might be time to examine that. And whether three years is right or not, I think, you know, we're open to, to trying something different to see if we can, because I am concerned about farmland. You know, I've seen the statistics where, you know, we're losing so many acres, you know, every day uh, to development, you know, and, you know, and so we look at what are the, 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 uh, I hate to say tools in the toolbox, but, you know, it is what it is, you know, and so this is something that the state has had and it was well-intentioned. And like I said, as commissioner, it's something that I, whether we pass a bill or not today, it's something that we want to continue to work on. Mr. Martinson with the counties, it's something we've had a lot of discussions about and we'll continue one way or another. Very good. Senator Dames has a question. I've got a couple of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for bearing ahead, with Senator. me here. Um, Commissioner Peterson, we were talking about wanting to keep ag land and agricultural, not expanding housing and this and stuff. How does this program stop that from happening? Commissioner Peterson. Mr. Chairman and, and, uh, and uh, Senator, you know, I think that's a good question. And that's where I was always stuck on the eight years, because I'd say like eight years, then you're committed to eight years. You know, and especially I really worked a lot on the Metro Preserve program. We had a lot of people in Dakota County and Wright County, not Wright County, uh, it was Carver County, were really interested in this program, you know, and we'd say, okay, eight years is kind of a you know, and that's why I'm not sure that three years is quite in, long enough, but I think it does make a commitment to people and that they can, you know, roll it over, but it is something that we're thinking about preserving uh, those properties. And as the commissioner said, um, uh, there's other uh, pieces that go along with this, whether it's, uh, um, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> the eminent domain, uh, there's also uh, issues that help with uh, assessments uh, is my understanding on this too. So I think that it is really, it is helpful to somebody who is trying to make that decision. So, uh, you know, and, and again, I, I defer back to the, might be helpful too, to revisit the 
legislative report that is probably done longer than ago than I thought it was, but I think there's some good information in that too as well. Senator Dames. A follow up, uh, Commissioner. So if I have land in this program, and a developer wants to buy it, I can sell it to him. Commissioner Peterson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, and again, uh, as I understand the, the program, you would have to opt out for three years. So you would have the three year uh, window on it. So currently, you Senator could Dames. Follow up, Mr. Chair, thank you. So currently, then, am I understanding this? If it's in for eight years, you could not sell the land for development for eight years. Would that be correct? Mr. Peterson. M Mr. Chairman, Did that is my understanding. And without uh, like a payback or something. Yes. And, uh, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if we Senator move it Davis. to follow up, Mr. Yep. Chair. So yep. if we move it to three years, then that means that they can sell it five years sooner. Commissioner Peterson. So Ms. then how are we helping preserve land if we want to preserve it so that it doesn't get sold for a development and now we're going to allow it to be sold in three years? Are we not allowing development then if I can sell it after three years? Mr. Mr. Chairman and Senator, well, that'd be correct if you were in the program, you know, but yes. you know, you're right. not assuming you're, I'm in yeah, the program, assuming you're in the program. That's yeah. correct. Yep. Yeah. So, so, but, but, so, so Commissioner Peterson and, and to Senator Dames issue, I mean, that's kind of the balancing act here. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's far enough out and somebody enrolls, any developer that's gonna buy it basically has to have an eight year holding period or an option that would be lowered to three. The flip side of it is we aren't getting many new enrollees. So all of that land that's not enrolled can be sold and, and developed a day later. Is that, is, that's kind of what I think you're getting at, Senator Daines, is it? How do, how do we find that balance? Sure. Exactly, I think that it's, if the program is gonna do what it's supposed to do, maybe there need, needs to be an exemption added to allow for solar gardens but not to be able to sell the land for eight years. I mean, if the agreement is you can't sell for eight years, then why are we changing that? It kind of defeats the purpose of the program. To me, now I might be totally misunderstanding something here, but because that sure could be, but and, it looks to me like uh, we're kind of taking the teeth out of the program for what we wanted it to do. I, I, I might be missing something. But if, I, if I could speak Mr. to this, Walter. Chair. Thank you. Um, uh, there's, there is, there's some balance here, certainly. Um, part of the reason we're coming as a rural county before you with this request is because this change has already been made to the Metro program. So the Metro program no longer has an eight year withdrawal period. And that's where the development pressure is the greatest. Um, so, uh, part of our reason for, for coming with this request is because if the Metro program where, where there is much more development pressure than there is in little rural Wasika County, um, if their withdrawal period has been lessened, then why wouldn't that be a reasonable request for Wasika County to, uh, to allow the plus side of that for our family farms that are turning over for um, kids who want to come back, particularly post-COVID, to little rural Wasika County and build a new house and raise their families on, on grandpa's farm. Those are, the, those are the pluses that we're looking for that would come from, from being able to, um, to withdraw in three years. And, um, and, and I appreciate the... Um, your, your words about the balance between preserving farm ground. In our experience in the rural program, and, and you stated this before, Senator, the hurdles we have to jump through to allow our, our property owners to, to do what is good and right and reasonable um, really has been hamstrung by this by this program and, and it is difficult and we're looking for ways to make it better on a local level. I know you're looking at the, the great big picture from 50,000 feet up. Oh, I'm, I'm, here, <laughs> I'm here to tell you from, from the ground, I have 
I have had lots and lots and lots of residents from Waseca County who have come with, oh, they wanna, they wanna build a house on grandpa's farm, but it was put in ag preserve when this 35 year old kid was being born. And now this, this is, a, is a hurdle that they have to try to get around to, to be able to do this. Um, and, and you stated, is, is it even worth it? That's, that's part of the reason we're here is to have these conversations. And I've really, really appreciated your time and your questions um, to make me think more deeply about it. And hopefully to give you some insight of what this program looks like from rural Minnesota not from the metro area, from rural Minnesota. Senator Dames. One more follow-up. Oh, by the way, Senator Dames, I don't think you're that tall, are you? <laughs> 15, <laughs> you can't look from 15,000 feet up, can you? <laughs> well, we'll Just a little joke we'll in there, Senator. <laughs> uh, uh, thank ahead. you, Mr. Chair. So, is part of what's driving this, and I'll be just right to the point, part of what's driving this is the fact that land, farmland has went up a whole lot, and you got people that want to retire, and they want to sell some farmland, and with the way this is set up, it's hard to do it if it's within that eight-year window. So let's change the window so we can sell some farmland at these astronomical prices because they're concerned about that changing. I'm going through that in, my, in several of my counties, that's exactly what's happening. They don't have a program like this, but I know of a lot of land that's being sold in the last six months. And it's because mom and dad are getting older and they see this, no children want to farm. They see this opportunity and they're selling that land now. And I'm just wondering how much of that is driving this to try to get this change made in order for people to take advantage of some very high land prices. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But you know, normally when you do a life, when you start planning for your estate and things like this, normally that's more than an eight year plan. And so, you know, I guess I'm not so sure that uh, the reason we're really doing this is the one we're talking about, but I'll leave it at that and I have no more comments, but thank you folks. Thank you for bringing the bill, John. And thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Malter. Yes, thank you so much, Senator. Um, I will tell you that in Waseca County, property, um, we wish that we were selling for, for big development. Um, we are in Ag County. I showed you the statistics about how, how much farm ground this is. Ag Preserve does not, does not prevent this property from being sold into production agriculture and for production agriculture to continue on it. And that's what we see in Waseca County. We, we don't see a ton of acres being lost to development. It's moving sideways. Somebody else is buying it and they're going to farm it. So Commissioner Malter, and then I know we're running close on time. So does it matter who owns the property if, if, if farmer Joe owns it and sells to developer X, and as long as developer X owns it and keeps it in uh, agriculture or farmland for eight years, does that still meet? If they're gonna unenroll it, farmer or developer X can just buy it a year later, unenroll it, and then they still have to keep it in eight years of farmland before they can get out of the program and do some change to it, or, or am I misunderstanding? That? No, that is, that is correct. That's my understanding. Um, and we've seen that that happen with um, some properties that were in um, in the egg preserve program. Um, they they were close to a lake, which would make for a, a nice house. And um, the piece of property got sold, and the next person bought it, knowing that it, they wouldn't be able to do anything for eight years. Okay. Other questions, members. This has been a great discussion, longer than we planned, but that's all right. <laughs> Members, I uh, wish or thought of getting you out early today. Uh, uh, we've, we've extended our education opportunity instead. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute, <laughs> Senator Jasinski's bill. <laughs> 
Senator Jasinski, any final comments, and then we will lay this bill over. Uh, uh, thank you. Really do appreciate this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was ready to lay it over about 45 minutes ago. So, <laughs> <laughs> so in response to Senator Anderson's comment, I'm going to put it back on you as the chair. But I uh, know uh, everybody, it's been a great conversation. I've learned a lot. I hope you've learned a lot. And if we can look at the program to make sure that it works for Minnesota, uh, it's well worth our time. So thank you again for taking the time to hear the bill today. Thank you, Senator Jasinski, and thank you, Commissioner Malter and Commissioner Peters. This bill is laid over for possible inclusion. Members, that does conclude our uh, long agenda of two bills today. And uh, thank you for uh, your participation. This meeting is adjourned.